Well, here we are. At home. In our living rooms. With our families. With those we love. Today, wherever you are located, know that you are not alone. You are not alone. We're still connected. Today, we gather as one body. One body. One body. Because the church is not a building. It never has been. It never has been. We gather today as one church. One church. To lift up one name. The name of Jesus. 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 So wherever you are, today is the day the Lord has made. Today is the day to give him thanks. So let's unite. Let's worship. Let's praise his name. For he is worthy of it today and every day. Because we are still the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. Good morning, church. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you again this morning, and we want to thank you for this time to worship and to be with you and to be about your word. Lord, I just pray that your word speaks to us. I pray, Lord, that it changes our lives. Lord, as we're going through this book of Revelation, I just thank you for it. I thank you for your promise of a blessing, even by reading it, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that it um, it goes deep into our hearts and into our minds, Lord, and it, it uh, encourages us to be a witness and to, um, to seek the lost, Lord, and to tell them about Jesus, Lord. Um, help us to do that, please, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
We continue to miss you, and we know you're all missing us and everybody. And uh, it's just, again, continue to pray for each other. Continue to pray for our church body, our neighborhoods, and our government. And uh, again, we're, we're going to all be back together again soon. I'm confident of that. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I know that, uh, you know, God just weeps for all of us through all of this. Just horrible times. we got parts of the country that are just experiencing experiencing things above and beyond this coronavirus with the tornadoes and that. So again, just there's just no shortage of things to pray for. Just know that, uh, you know, you're all in our prayers. We love you all, and we just can't wait to see you all again soon. Um, again, ties and offerings, I can't thank you enough. Everybody's been continuing just to, to give. And again, we can give by uh, uh, mailing our offerings and ties into Post Office Box 536 here in Camas, or you can also pay through uh, WSHCChurch.net, and that's through PayPal. So again, thanks to everybody for just keeping on top of that and uh, just helping us to keep all the expenses covered. We did get an email this um, week from Pastor Ernie in the Philippines, and he just said that, you know, with them too, they're just struggling, having a hard time with the virus. They're just... Uh, they're in quarantine and lockdown. That's been extended because of the spread over there. So just continue to keep them in your prayers too because 
they're just working hard, wanting to get outside their homes, go out and preach the gospel, and they're in lockdown. And they just said they just have to have a really valid reason to even leave their homes. And, you know, so they're being watched. So continue to pray for them. Continue to pray for uh, Tim and his family in India. If you want to continue to give to either one of those ministries, either in the Philippines or India, just, uh, you know, give online or just uh, send a check. Make sure you just uh, know what you, who you want to give that to. And we'll make sure that uh, those funds get to them. So... Again, Mike's uh, teachings are going to continue to be posted on our website, and also there's a link on there to YouTube if you want to watch them. And for some reason, if somebody can't access it that way, you want to get a copy of it, we still have the disc that we can print and get to you. So just put that request out, and somebody will make sure that you get that as soon as possible. So again, just know that we miss you all, we love you, and we can't wait till we're all back together again. All right, thanks. Well, hi, all. Glad we're here again. And um, we, as Bill said, we really miss you guys and uh, look forward to the day when we can meet again and uh, be together. It's great that we can do this, but there's nothing better uh, than uh, getting together and fellowshipping. So looking forward to that day. We are preparing for it uh, so that we can be uh, ready for uh, that when it happens. Um, so uh, we will be meeting together again. Uh, unless, of course, the Lord comes before that, which I'm okay with, too. Um, but um, so I'm um, looking forward to that day. So let's pray before we start. Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord, as we look in again and uh, see what you have for us. And uh, thank you for this incredible book of Revelation, Lord, as we study it. And uh, we ask that you would open our minds and our hearts, that we would see Jesus more clearly, in whose name we pray. Amen. So uh, we're continuing our study in the book of Revelation, Countdown to Eternity. We are currently in chapter 13. We're at the midway point of the seven-year tribulation period at this point. And the devil is angry because he knows his time is short. And so our last message was the beast part one as we studied the first four verses of chapter 13. And our points were, the beast comes out of a rebellious world order, he is full of blasphemy, and he will be beastly. And of course, we're talking about that character called the Antichrist, which the book of Revelation calls the beast. In fact, we could translate that word beast as monster. This guy is going to be a monster. Uh, as we might call a serial killer or a psychopath, uh, a monster. This guy is going to be the worst monster the world has ever seen. Now, as I said, we are at the midway point of the seven-year tribulation. I believe the rapture has already taken place at this point in time, and the true church is in heaven. Seven seals have been opened, and seven trumpet judgments have already been poured out on earth. And the devil at this point is no longer having access to heaven as he once did. He knows his time is short, and he's going to put everything he has into this man that we call the Antichrist. And so today's message is the beast, part two, as we continue our study in chapter 13. And we're going to look at verses 5 through 10 today. And we're going to take a look at a couple of his characteristics. Revelation 13, verse 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. In verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And so let's talk about two of the beast's main characteristics. First, 
he will be Mr. Big Mouth. Mr. Big Mouth, verse 5. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue 40, for 42 months. So in the first half of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to rise to power and influence, not all at once, but gradually he'll rise to power. He's going to be a good guy at first or seem like a good guy. Uh, he's going to be accepted. He's going to be a peacemaker at first. He's going to have the answers to the world's problems. But in the last half, he's going to be a beast for three and a half years or 42 months or 1,260 days. He's going to have a big blasphemous mouth and notice he will speak great things he's going to be a big mouth a master politician who will be able to sway people with his words of speaking great things and his mouth is going to be like the mouth of a lion with lion-like qualities of power and strength the prophet daniel also mentions this very uh, thing about his big mouth over in Daniel 7 verse 8 it says I was considering the horns and there was another horn a little horn coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words and there, then verse 11, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. And verse 20, and the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. So over and over again it talks about how this Antichrist is going to have pompous words. He's going to speak of great things. And my point is, this guy is going to be given the ability to captivate people with his words. Uh, this has happened many times in the past, not the least of which was Adolf Hitler. Uh, when Hitler uh, would give a speech, he would start off very calm and very subdued and quietly start to talk. And as he went along, he would amp up until he was screaming at the end. And he would suck the people in until they were yelling back with him, Heil Hitler. In fact, many people thought that Hitler was the Antichrist. And there have been many world leaders and presidents and all who have been named as the Antichrist over the years. Hitler was thought to be the Antichrist. JFK was thought to be the Antichrist. In fact, most presidents of the United States have been called the Antichrist, including the current one. Along with Henry Kissinger, uh, many of the popes, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. But the Bible doesn't tell us who he is. In fact, Paul tells us that he won't be revealed until the rapture of the church takes place. But we can know his characteristics. And his main characteristic will be a big mouth able to convince people of his agenda. And he's going to be very charismatic. He's going to be an expert with words. And... He will have a commanding presence and he'll look the part as well. He'll be very handsome, he'll be pleasant to look at, and he will also be intimidating. Again, Daniel 7.20, it says uh, at the end of verse 20 there, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And so the combination of his amazing speaking abilities uh, and his outward appearance and his charismatic personality is going to make him irresistible to this world at first. And this guy is going to seem like the savior of the world, having the answers to the world's uh, problems. And so verse 6 uh, Revelation 13 continues, and then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. 
So first, his blasphemy is against God. And the word blasphemy comes right from the Greek. That's where we get the word blasphemy from. And it means to slander. This guy is going to slander God. And I believe it's going to be blatant. He will make false, intentional, damaging statements against God. Daniel, again, tells us the same thing. Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. And Daniel 11, verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god and shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods. And so this guy will have absolutely no use for God. Remember what uh, Revelation 13, 2 said earlier in the chapter. It says, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So it's going to be the devil who is empowering this guy. So obviously, he's not going to have any use for God. The devil wants to be God. The devil wants to be like God. And so look at verse uh, 6 again. Notice he also blasphemes God's name. And I don't think you have to look far to see that right now. Uh, God's name is being blasphemed in every corner of the world and slandered all over the place. It's in movies. It's on TV. It's in books. It's all around us all the time. And also... People are practically, uh, uh, practically blaspheming God by the way they live. And uh, right is wrong, wrong is right, up is down, down is up. It, it seems like mankind is bent on doing the opposite of whatever God wants. It says that the Antichrist will also blaspheme God's tabernacle. Now this could be talking about God's tabernacle in heaven, But it also could be talking about the temple that will be built or rebuilt at that time. Paul the Apostle writes in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Remember it? The Antichrist is called the son of perdition. The only other person called that is Judas Iscariot the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. Now watch this. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that, folks, is blasphemy. It is blasphemy. And we're going to see him do this later on in uh, chapter 13. But looking at verse uh, 6 again, notice also he slanders or blasphemes those who dwell in heaven. And this could be referring to the angels in heaven like Michael, the archangel. But many see this as him slandering the church which has already been raptured and is in heaven. They are now out of the devil's reach because the dragon has been cast down to the earth and so he slanders them through the Antichrist on the earth. And so all of these can be involved in this slandering. The Antichrist is going to slander anything Christian, anything Christ-like. Remember, Antichrist is in the place of Christ. He The devil wants to set up his kingdom through the Antichrist in order to prevent Jesus from setting up his kingdom. So first, he is Mr. Big Mouth. That's his main, one of his main uh, characteristics. And secondly, he's going to have worldwide authority. Verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And the saints here are not the church. They are the tribulation saints, those who come to believe during the tribulation period. 
They are not the church because Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And yet here the Antichrist prevails against these saints. Daniel, Daniel writes the same thing in Daniel 7.25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And so during this uh, uh, tribulation period, especially the last half of the tribulation, Antichrist is going to target the Jews and he's going to target the believers of that day who come to know Christ, who put their trust in Christ during the tribulation period. And I think about the language that is ramping up right now against Christians and Christianity. We're already seeing that happen. Uh, it's happening in the world as a precursor of what the Antichrist is going to do in the tribulation period. So uh, looking at verse 7 again, it says their authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Don't miss that. He is given authority. In essence, at least for a limited time, he's going to have authority over the entire world world. And uh, so remember from last week, this guy is going to be in charge of a global confederacy represented and led by 10 horns, 10 horns of power, if you will, or 10 kings. We talked about that last Sunday, a revived Roman empire. And as you know, there are groups today that are determined to bring a global government about and a global economy, and a global religion. In fact, those are the three pillars of a one-world system, a global government, a global economy, and a global religion. And all three of these had their modern beginnings in the year 1948. The same year that Israel became a nation again. It's as if God's prophetic time clock started again in 1948. And of course, Israel becoming, an, becoming a nation again in that year is a major sign that we are now in the end times. And so going to the next slide, the root of the global government was the establishment of the United Nations and the Bet Benelux Treaty, both in 1948. The root of the global economy also first began in 1948 when Bell Labs and AT&T developed the transistor, which opened the door for the modern computer. Once the computer took over, it enabled banks to link up around the world. That happened in 1948. Also in 1948, the route for global religion was established with the World Council of Churches. And one of the purposes of the World Council of Churches was to develop a milder, more inclusive religion. All religions lead to God. Uh, all ways lead to God. Just pick one. Tolerance is the key word of the World Council of Churches. In fact, the situation we have today because of this pandemic is very interesting to me. It's caused the entire world to go into an economic freefall. A worldwide economic, governmental, and religious depression, if you will. And folks, this is the perfect uh, uh, type of scenario for the Antichrist to move into office and to get the whole world in his hands. I'm not saying it's going to happen like that in this particular situation, but it is a possibility. And the shaky economy is a perfect setup for a one-world system. Back in 1957, Paul Henry Spake, who was one of the early planners of the common market, which eventually became the European Union, he said this, and I've quoted this many times. He said, we do not need another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. 
And he says this, send us such a man and be he God or the devil, we will receive him. That is an incredible, incredible quote uh, to one of the founders of the European Union. He didn't realize he was being prophetic at the time. He was just voicing his frustration. Nevertheless, very prophetic concerning the Antichrist. Arnold Toynbee, also a British historian, said this, the nations are ready to give the kingdoms of the world to any one man who will offer us a solution to our world's problems. And this is what is going to happen when Antichrist rises to power. This world, the world, uh, this world kingdom will give him authority. In fact, I don't know if you caught it or not, but the former uh, prime minister of the UK uh, a couple of weeks ago is calling for a global government because of COVID-19. Uh, this article from The Guardian, it says... Gordon Brown has urged world leaders to create a temporary form of global government to tackle the twin medical and economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The former labor prime minister who was at the center of the international efforts to tackle the impact of the near meltdown of the banks in 2008 said there was a need for a task force invol involving world leaders, health experts, and the heads of the international organizations that would have executive powers to coordinate the response. And he says this, quote, this is not something that can be dealt with in one country, he said. There has to be a coordinated global response. And so the current uh, crisis or another one like it, could be a setup for the puzzle pieces to fall into place for a one-world system just as the Bible predicts. And keep in mind, there hasn't been a world power of any significance since the Roman Empire. But there will be. And it will probably include some form of the European Union, a revived Roman Empire coming up uh, from that area over there. Doesn't mean it will just include them, uh, but they will be a big part of it. Notice again in Revelation 17, 12. It says, the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have received no kingdom as yet, when this was being written, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And these are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. And so Satan is going to install his antichrist over the nations of this world. And he's going to try to set up his kingdom in place of Christ's kingdom. Satan through all of this will try to prevent the setting up of God's kingdom on earth. And ultimately the antichrist along with the nations will actually take up arms against Jesus Christ at his second coming to try to prevent him from coming again. And the Bible says that God in heaven is going to laugh. He's going to laugh. So Revelation 13, verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So all of those who are dwelling on the earth, the earth dwellers or the inhabitants of the earth, remember that's an expression for unbelievers who are on earth at that time. Those who have their roots in the earth, whose names are not written in the book of life. They will worship the beast. They will pledge allegiance to the Antichrist. How will they do that? Well, probably in a similar way that the Roman emperors did it. They declared themselves as God and the people pledged allegiance to them. They were required to say, Caesar is Lord. Now, 
they saw that more as a political thing than idolatry back then. But nevertheless, that's what it was. It was idolatry. And of course, the early Christians refused to do that and were persecuted because of it. So the Antichrist is going to demand allegiance from this world. That's an important point when you consider the mark of the beast and all of the things that we're still going to talk about. It's a dem he's demanding allegiance. People will be identifying themselves with the Antichrist. And notice it says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I love that because God always knew what his plan was. It didn't take him by surprise. Adam and Eve sinning in the garden didn't take him by surprise. This was an eternal covenant between the Father and the Son. It wasn't a surprise that Jesus went to the cross. It was a covenant from the foundation of the world. He was slain from the foundation of the world. God always had a plan. Peter says this in 1 Peter 1. Verse 20, he says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Where is your faith and hope? Is it in the scientists? Is it in the physicians? I'm not saying that those people aren't important. They are. But where is your hope for this pandemic or anything else that comes your way? Is it in God or is it in people? Verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Very short verse, but a very telling verse. This phrase was used by Jesus over and over again in the first three chapters of Revelation. Seven times, in fact, it was used in chapters 2 and 3, except for one thing. There's something missing here. In chapters 2 and 3, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so the phrase, what the Spirit says to the churches, is missing here. Why? I believe it's because the church is not here during the tribulation period. That phrase is conspicuous by its absence. In fact, during all of these chapters about the tribulation period, the word church is not mentioned once. In chapters 1 through 3, it's mentioned 18 times. But in these chapters about the tribulation, from chapter 6 uh, all the way to, to 19, in fact, uh, the word church is not mentioned again all the way until the end of the book. So verse 10, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And here is the patience and the faith of the saints. That's kind of a tough uh, verse, uh, con confusing verse. Uh, but I think we get insight into what it means from the Old Testament, from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. Send them out of my sight and let them go. Verse 2. And when they ask you, where shall we go? You shall say to them, thus says the Lord. Those who are for pestilence to pestilence. And those who are for the sword to the sword. And those who are for famine to famine, and those who are for captivity to captivity. In other words, this was a judgment of God. They would be taken captive and experience different judgments. And so this terror by, by and through the Antichrist will be permitted to take place as God judges the world. And he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. What goes around comes around. A man reaps what he sows, and God will judge and make all things right because God is ultimately in control, and God is just, and God is good. 
And even though the tribulation saints are going to be persecuted and sought out by the Antichrist, they're encouraged to be patient and faithful and stick to their faith even to the death. Once the Antichrist gains domination, he will begin to pour out his wrath on this earth. And at the same time, God will also be pouring out his wrath on the earth. Wow. Intense times coming upon this earth. And so uh, looking at uh, his characteristics, besides the two we talked about, he'll be an intellectual genius. Uh, He'll be a persuasive orator. He'll be a shrewd politician, a financial genius, a military leader, a powerful organizer, and a religious guru. We'll talk about that more next Sunday. The hope that we have as Christians is this. We are not, if you're a Christian, if you are born again, a true believer, we are not looking for the Antichrist. We are looking for Jesus Christ. And Jesus can come for his church at any moment. There is nothing that I can see prophetically that has to happen before the rapture of the church. It can happen at any moment. Look up. Luke 12, 35, we'll close with this. It says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Verse 37, Blessed, or oh, how happy are those servants whom the fat master, uh, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Verse 38, and if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Verse 40, therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Be ready, be watching, be hoping in the Lord. Now, next Sunday... John sees another beast rising up. And this is the false prophet who will eventually lead to the mark of the beast. And so we'll start to talk about that uh, next Sunday. Stay tuned. This Wednesday, um, we're going to finish up the book of Jonah, uh, chapter 4. So be watching for that as well on our website and on YouTube. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today again, Lord. And uh, man, what an incredible book this is, Lord. And we just praise you and give you glory, Lord. Uh, Thank you for um, letting us study this. Thank you for telling us these things in advance. And again, we pray, uh, continue to pray for this uh, pandemic that is among us right now, Lord. And we pray that we would be able to meet again soon, Lord. Pray that you would comfort all those uh, who have lost uh, loved ones through this and that through it, that they would turn to Jesus Christ if they haven't already, Lord. And um, we pray that for protection uh, for the people in our church and beyond, uh, that you would protect us from this pandemic, Lord, and watch over us, Lord, as we seek you with all of our hearts. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, Have a great week this week, and stay healthy. See you later.
Jesus' name, amen.